Hello, welcome. It is Eric Erickson here. The Eric Erickson Show. The phone number 877-97-ERIC-877-973-7425. Holy moly. You know, so the Democrats tell us that Donald Trump is destroying the norms of American society. And last night at a, a CNN LGBTQIABCDEFG event in Washington, Beto O'Rourke had this to say and listen to him. We're going to play this clip, clip twice because you got to pick up on two different things. First, listen to Beto O'Rourke. This is from your LGBTQ plan, and here's what you write. This is a quote. Freedom of religion is a fundamental right, but it should not be used to discriminate. Do you think religious institutions uh, like colleges, churches, charities, should they lose their tax-exempt status if they oppose same-sex marriage? Yes. There can be no reward, no benefit, no tax break for anyone or inst any institution, any organization in America that denies the full human rights and the full civil rights of every single one of us. And so as president, we're going to make that a priority, and we are going to stop those who are infringing upon the human rights of our fellow Americans. The human rights of our fellow Americans. We're, we're going to go after the churches now. This is Beto O'Rourke. Remember, when Beto O'Rourke first said that the Democrats were going to come after our guns and confiscate our guns, all the other Democrats said, no, no, we're not. No, we're not. No, we're not. And now they're all talking about um, – now they're all talking about confiscating guns. Now they're all talking about mandatory gun buybacks. Beto O'Rourke pulled them to the left on that issue. Now I'm going to play it again because you heard it, but you actually need to focus on it. I'm going to play the Beto O'Rourke clip again, and I want you to listen to the crowd. This is a who's who from the Human Rights Campaign. If you ever see people driving around and they've got the, the, the blue square on the back of their car, it's a little sticker. It's a blue square or rectangle with two little yellow horizontal lines, and equal signs. The, the, the two little yellow lines are the equal signs, yellow equal signs in a blue square. That's the Human Rights Campaign. It is a, a very militant gay rights group, um, very, very aggressive, um, which likes to shut down conservatives, likes to target conservatives, uh, believes in agitation on these issues, uh, and, and is all about getting rid of churches in this country that uh, support traditional biblical orthodoxy. Listen again to the crowd. This is a who's who of a gay rights elite. Listen. This is from your LGBTQ plan, and here's what you write. This is a quote. Freedom of religion is a fundamental right, but it should not be used to discriminate. Do you think religious institutions uh, like colleges, churches, charities, should they lose their tax-exempt status if they oppose same-sex marriage? Yes. There can be no reward, no benefit, no tax break for anyone or inst any institution, any organization in America that denies the full human rights and the full civil rights of every single one of us. And so as president, we're going to make that a priority and we are going to stop those who are infringing upon the human rights of our fellow Americans. So if, if you're at Covenant College up in North Georgia, uh, you're, you're, you're toast. If you're at a Christian adoption agency, you're you're toast. If you're at a Christian healthcare institution, you're toast. Yeah, I mean, you know, they're they're going for gay rights. What about abortion? Now we can get back to Elizabeth Warren and and the the absolute dripping with contempt from the the crowd last night. Again, this is the human rights campaign, and I can't emphasize this enough. The Human Rights Campaign is the leading gay rights organization in this country, and it is deeply influential among Democrats, increasingly influential among Republicans. For Elizabeth Warren to stand on stage and belittle traditional values in the country and have the crowd go wild, to have Beto O'Rourke stand on stage and have the crowd go wild when he says that uh, he wants to take away the tax-exempt status of, of not just churches and schools, but individuals. Did you catch that Beto O'Rourke says, says individuals? 
uh, that he wants to take away that as well. This is from your LGBTQ plan, and here's what you write. This is a quote. Freedom of religion is a fundamental right, but it should not be used to discriminate. Do you think religious institutions uh, like colleges, churches, charities, should they lose their tax-exempt status if they oppose same-sex marriage? Yes. And the crowd goes wild. There can be no reward, no, no, reward, benefit, no benefit, no tax break, no tax for break. anyone or for, any institution, any for anyone. No, no benefit, no reward for anyone. It's not just institutions; it's anyone. They're coming after you and your beliefs. You, you know, one of the things that is happening in on the cultural front right now. And it's why I am doing this program myself. Uh, I am my own ad person. I am my own affiliate relations person. Uh, My producer, Charlie, does yeoman's work on all of this with me. Uh, And one of the reasons we are doing it this way, out of the gate, is because I understand what it's like these days on these issues in in media. I had a, a national brand drop me because progressives complained about me. They, they didn't want this company advertising with me because I'm one of those Christians. They're going to come for you and me, and they're going to be led by the Democratic Party. This is no longer a fringe movement within the Democratic Party. You will recall, I hope, that it was Barack Obama's uh, solicitor general who said before the Supreme Court when they argued gay marriage that, yes, the tax-exempt status of faith-based organizations may have to go away. It's not like this is some fringe view. Barack Obama, Solicitor General, argued this point before the United States Supreme Court. Now you've got Elizabeth Warren on stage uh, dripping with condescension for people in traditional marriage. You've got Beto O'Rourke saying that um, tax-exempt status has to go away. And then you've got Joe Biden saying this, which, by the way, this is not true. Gay couples are more likely to stay together longer than heterosexual couples. Now, the, the crowd uh, applauds at this, and I'm sure they think he's he's speaking truth to power, but that's not actually true. And it's really, really not true when you get into the issue of monogamy, but we don't want to go there. And yet the crowd goes wild. And then there's this. This is, this is the part where when you see what's going on in society right now, honestly, let, let me just tell you, when I see what's going on in society right now, It makes me, it reaffirms for me my biblical worldview. Because I see that as the church declines in the West, new things don't crop up, old pagan things crop up. The pagan things the church for a very long time pushed aside and said, this is deviant, we we can't do this. Those things are now being mainstreamed again. And if you don't like them, you're the bad person. Gertrude Himmelfarb, the historian, said um, deviancy becomes normal. Normal becomes deviant. The the board, two-parent heterosexual nuclear household uh, becomes bad. Uh, this ongoing progressive march. So CNN brings out a nine-year-old girl who says she is a he, is dressed in a suit, who looks like a little boy, Elementary school student from Massachusetts likes to play hockey. Jacob. All right, Jacob. Um, my name is Jacob, and I'm a nine-year-old transgender American. Uh-huh. My question is. All right, Jacob. Hold on. What will you do in your first week as president to make sure that kids like me feel safer in schools? And what do you think schools need to do better to make sure that I don't have to worry about anything but my homework? Oh, I like that question, Jacob. We're going to do this. And we don't even need to get into what she says, but did you know there's a movement abroad right now? Uh, in the UK, there is a, a young woman who decided that she was a transgender male when she was a kid and has now grown up and realized she actually is a woman and she's trying to start a nonprofit to help other people who decided they were transgender and their parents went all in on it and helped them and foster this. And then they're like, wait a second. No, I'm, I'm really not. I want to I want to be who God created me. And this woman is being harassed now. 
she's being harassed. They, they don't want her to be able to set up a nonprofit to help people like her because uh, to do so would be to some degree an admission uh, that this isn't normal. It's certainly not biological. And she's being harassed. And, and here it is, CNN, mainstreaming this last night on stage to a cheering crowd. This is this is crazy. And again, this this just reaffirms my worldview that that God is real and he's got a plan and we are all sinners. And when you shove him aside, old ideas crop back up, not not new ideas. Everything repeats itself. This is just bizarre. But hang on. There's even more. A buddy of mine just texted me about that Beto O'Rourke clip. It says, 2009, the Democrats' position is, hey, how is my gay marriage going to hurt you? We just want marriage equality. In 2019, if you don't bow before us, we will shut down your schools and your churches and your hospitals and take away your tax exempt status. Just uh, the, the progressive radicalism. It's very predictable, the, the incrementalism on this stuff. Now, the, the other thing that is so very predictable these days is uh, the NBA is flailing all over themselves. The, the, the Portland Trailblazers have decided to go in on the, the BDS movement, uh, boycott, divest, and sanction Israel. Uh, the, the Antifa basketball team in Portland distancing themselves from a company because that company does business with Israel. At the same time... The NBA continues in China to flail around. The NBA has announced there will be no more press conferences in China. I want you to listen to Steve Kerr. If you'll recall yesterday that the president singled out Popovich and, and Kerr from the NBA. I, I, I want you actually, before I play Steve Kerr, let me play Popovich. I've got Popovich. Uh, listen to Popovich's answer. Freedom of speech. I felt great again. So he's been a heck of a leader in that respect, and very courageous. Uh, when you compare it to what we've had to live through the last three years, there's a big difference, big gap there, leadership-wise and courage-wise. And it wasn't easy for him to say. Uh, he said that in an environment uh, fraught with possible economic peril. But he sided with the principles that uh, we all hold dearly, uh, or most of us did, uh, until the last few years. So uh, I'm, I'm thrilled with, with what he said. And as I said, the courage and leadership displayed is uh, off the charts by comparison. And, you know, we've all talked about and heard about all the questions that all the talking heads have and everybody for the last three years. What kind of country do we want to be? Who are we? Where do we want to go? That sort of thing. Uh, Adam said something that helps you understand what direction you need to go in uh, rather than the cowardice of not being able to respond to something like the murder of Mr. Khashoggi. And there are many, many incidents like that where it's leadership and courage mean nothing. It's all about personal aggrandizement. So uh, I was thrilled. Just... Yeah, so this is Greg Popovich of the NBA, who is praising Adam Silver, the the NBA uh, commissioner, in a not that's an absolute not answer. It, 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 that was a word salad of trying to avoid saying anything at all about China. The players have done this. The coaches are doing this. And now they're saying they will do nothing else on the issue. They will not have any more press conferences in China. You know, what's so funny is the CNN reporter yesterday, I played the audio on the show yesterday, so the CNN reporter tried to ask a question about this, and the NBA spokesperson shut her down, wouldn't let her ask the players about the China situation. And then afterwards, the NBA came out and said, oh, we apologize, we shouldn't have done that. And the media's like, oh, thank you, NBA, for recognizing you should not do that. And now they're saying, oh, we're not going to do any more press conferences. Nope, no more. Can't, can't ask any more questions at all. And yet the media praised the NBA. It was so predictable, and the media, of course, let's be honest here, a lot of members of the media, they're sympathetic to the NBA. They don't want to admit it, 
but they're sympathetic to it. I mean, they're propaganda mouthpieces themselves for progressive causes, particularly the DNC. They understand what the Democrats or what the NBA is doing. I may have to go buy a Ford from Carolina Ford in Honeypath, South Carolina. Uh, the <laughs> where is it? that? That's that's near Greenville, is it? I think this show um, penetrates that area of South Carolina. Uh, yes, 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 yes. Uh, it's not that far from Hartwell, Georgia. Um, it's south of Anderson. Yeah, I've got I got relatives who live in that area near Ware Shoal, South Carolina. Yes, I know. I knew I'd been in there before. I've been there before. This Ford dealership over there is giving away uh, Bibles, flags, and AR-15 vouchers. That's right. Um, you, you're going to be gifted a Bible, an American flag, and a four hundred dollar voucher for a Smith and Wesson AR-15. Um, if you choose not to go for the voucher, they'll deduct the $400 from the cost of the Ford. A- amen and hallelujah. <laughs> I may need to go over there and, and, and buy a, buy a Ford. I, I'm a, a Chevy guy, GM guy myself, but I, I, I could totally do something like that. Okay. 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 We got to get into Steve Kerr real quick. I, I want you to listen to this answer. They cannot help themselves. And here's the thing. It, it, the, they're doing themselves a favor in the way they are covering this for China. And they know that the American media, as long as they bash Donald Trump, will be okay. To, to set the stage here, we need to go back to the president's statement about the NBA yesterday. Well, the NBA is a different thing. I mean, I watch uh, this guy, Steve Kerr, and he was like a little boy. He was so scared to be even answering the question. He couldn't answer the question. He was shaking. Oh, 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 I don't know. I don't know. He didn't know how to answer the question. And yet he'll talk about the United States very badly. I watched Popovich, sort of the same thing, but he didn't look quite as scared, actually. But they talk badly about the United States. But when it talks about China, they don't want to say anything bad. I thought it was pretty sad, actually. Um... Are you okay it'll be it'll be very it'll be very interesting. Excuse me. Are you okay then with the Chinese government pressuring the NBA over Hong Kong? They have to work out their own situation. The NBA is they know what they're doing. By the way, can, can I just stop and say that this was disappointing in the president? He had the perfect opportunity to seize the high ground on this issue and throw it at the NBA. None of whom like him. None of whom like him. And and because of the trade talks he's in, he didn't feel like he could do it. But. I watched the way that, like, Kerr and Popovich and some of the others were pandering to China, and yet to our own country, they don't, it's like they don't respect it. It's like they don't respect it. I said, what a difference. Isn't it sad? It's very sad. To me, it's very sad. Yeah, very sad, very sad. And and he's focusing on Kerr. Well, Kerr was asked about that, Steve Kerr of the Warriors. Again, Steve Kerr is a hyper-progressive who has taken strong stands in the United States uh, against religious liberty, against traditional values, against gun ownership, uh, against all sorts of stuff. Listen to how he responds to a reporter asking him about China. Um, it has not come up in terms of people asking me about it, uh, people discussing it. Nor has uh, our record of uh, human rights abuses come up either, you know. Um. I, and I, 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 I was a terrible host here. It was, Steve Kerr was asked about, have people in China, have people in China asked you about Chinese human rights abuse? As if anyone in China would be allowed to ask about it. Um, it has not come up in terms of people asking me about it, uh, people discussing it. Nor has uh, our record of uh, human rights abuses come up either, you know, uh, things that our country needs to look at and resolve. Um, that hasn't come up either. So none of us are perfect, and we all have uh, different issues that we have to get to. And saying that is my right as an American doesn't mean that I hate my country. It means I want to address things, right? Right. So he has he acknowledges he has a right in this country, but he, he plays willful ignorant, willfully ignorant when it comes to China. People in China didn't ask me about, uh, 
you know, people owning AR-15s and mowing each other down in a mall. Wait, wait. So now he's going to bash the United – he's in China bashing the United States. I wasn't asked that question. So we can play this game all we want and go all over the map and, you know, there's this issue and that issue. And um, and that concentration camp complex and this concentration camp? Place and there's more gray than black and white. Wait, wait. There's more gray than black and white. It, for those of you who don't who haven't been following, I don't know how you exist, but – China, uh, unlike this country, unlike the claims of, of AOC and others, China actually does operate concentration camps. In fact, you can see the concentration camps on satellite maps of China. You can. They they call them detainment facilities. They are re-education camps where people are rounded up who have religious beliefs, and they are locked away in these places, giant prisons, where they are re-educated in the communist way. And until they are willing to reject their God and sign an, a statement rejecting their God, they're not allowed out. They may die there. The conditions are brutal there. It is all designed to pressure them. I don't know that Americans actually fathom this. During the Roman Empire, do you know where the word traitor comes from? The word traitor comes from the traditors. The Tratadors were Christians in the Roman Empire who gave up their scripture. They traded their scripture in exchange for their life. See, in scripture at the time, there was no printing press, so all the letters from the apostles were handwritten. And people that it had underground systems of rewriting the letters. That's why there are so many of them. You know, we have only ten copies of Julius Caesar's uh, war, wars, the, his his um, chronicles that Julius Caesar wrote. And the most recent copy we have of Julius Caesar is from about a thousand years after Julius Caesar wrote it. All of the original copies were were in in the the copies of the originals were destroyed. The most recent copy we have is from about a thousand years after Julius Caesar actually wrote um, his his story, chronicles of war. I forget what you call them all of a sudden. Um, the the history of the Gallic campaign, I think. We actually have ten copies of Julius Caesar's work. Of scripture, we have about 6,000 copies. In fact, if you take the early church fathers of Clement, Polycarp, and Ignatius, those were three of the very first followers. Clement is written about in Philippians, and he followed Peter and, and um, Paul. Uh, Ignatius and Polycarp were disciples of John the Apostle. They lived in Turkey. Ignatius, very famously, was carted off to Rome uh, to be uh, disemboweled and thrown to the lions and wrote a great deal about uh, the joy of persecution. Polycarp was uh, burned at the stake. Clement was tied to an anchor and thrown into the sea. From these three men, we can recreate almost the entirety of the New Testament from their writings. They, they quoted the letters of the New Testament so much, we can pretty much recreate the entire New Testament from people who lived within 50 to 60 years of Jesus' death. We can't do that with the works of Julius Caesar. We can't do that with the works of um, some of the, the Suetonius. We, we can't do that with the works of Trajan. We can't do that with the works of Marcus Aurelius. We can do it because the, the, the local Christian communities did this massive writing campaign of transcribing the letters from the apostles and circulating them in an underground way among the Christians in early Rome. And so what would happen is the Romans would come to local communities. Someone would be added as a Christian. They would go to them and essentially say, uh, hand over your scripture, trade your scripture, try to your scripture, and we will let you live. You, you make a sacrifice to the emperor, we'll let you live. And people would do that. They would hand over the scripture to be burned. And then they would make a sacrifice to the emperor. They were called the traditories. And we get the word traitor from them. The Chinese are doing the exact same thing. It, it, it's remarkably profound that the Chinese are doing exactly what the Romans did. You must, you are rounded up and you're put in a detention facility. You must hand in your Bible 
and you must make an oath of rejecting God in favor of China. In fact, Christians in China who are on welfare, who who are poor, are told they will get no benefits, they will get no money, and they will get no food from China unless they take off their walls any religious artifacts, either crosses or pictures of Jesus or quotes of Scripture, and put up pictures of President Xi of China. I'm not making that up. It is very much what the Romans did in the first and second century when the word traitor originated as the traditories, people who traded scripture for their life. That's exactly what China is doing. And you can see these facilities on satellites. It is well known. It is well documented. There are Chinese dissidents around the world who have documented this, who have sneaked into these places as guards and come out. There are guards who worked in these places and were converted by the Christians in these places. But it's not just the Christians either. It's the Muslim Uyghurs from far western China. It is the the Tibetan Buddhists as well who are in these places. And all of them are told to give up their sacred artifacts and scripture and pledge an oath to China, rejecting all forms of religion. These places exist. In Hong Kong right now, you can see live streams of the police tear-gassing protesters. The Chinese made an agreement with Great Britain when Britain handed over uh, Hong Kong in the 1990s, that China would allow Hong Kong to be autonomous until I think 2030, 2028, 2030, somewhere in there. And China has had enough. And the reason they've had enough is because so many people from China go to Hong Kong and come back and are amazed at the freedom and access in Hong Kong. Uh, You can get the internet there. It's outside the Great Firewall of China. So you go to China from Hong Kong and suddenly you can learn about the Tiananmen Massacre. Then you can't in China. You can realize the Chinese have been lying. Well, China doesn't like that, and they want to now get rid of that a decade sooner. This is something you can read about in American newspapers. This is something you can talk to people in Hong Kong about. This is something you can see with your own eyes. And yet here are Steve Kerr and and Greg Popovich and Andrew Silver and the like, all denying that this happens, all denying what they see with their own eyes, what they hear with their own ears, because they don't want to offend the Chinese. They want the Chinese money. And it's not just them. It is Apple. It is Marriott. It is Nike. It is United Airlines. It is American Airlines. It is Just American company after American company. And what's so amazing is there are a lot of progressives who say, what's wrong with this? There actually are a lot of progressives out there who are okay with China. They're okay with the authoritarian Chinese state. Wokeness is just another form of authoritarianism. Again, do we need to play the Beto O'Rourke clip? I think I played it four times already. Beto O'Rourke wants to use the United States government to punish individuals and churches and schools and charities that are not down with the progressive gay rights agenda. How is that much different from China other than the Chinese don't allow homosexuality? That's a crime in China still. But using the tools of the state to coerce and punish those who don't go along with the state. And yet, the people who are lamenting China right now, they're okay with Beto O'Rourke doing that. You hear him cheering in the crowd. Listen to, to Cory Booker talk about Catholic schools. I attended an all-girls Catholic high school in Bergen County, New Jersey, where during my years there, proposals for an LGBTQ plus club or gay-straight alliance were routinely rejected, despite the school's messaging of acceptance and love. A few towns away, at another Catholic high school, a female teacher was fired for being married to a woman. How would you address the, at times, juxtaposing issues of religious freedom and LGBTQ rights? It's a great question, and thank you very much. Look, this is something that I've been dealing with all my life as a Christian. Um, People who want to use religion as a justification for discrimination, uh, and often are creating environments that are so contrary to my religious beliefs, as it said in Micah, or what do you want from your Lord, or what do you want from your people, which is to do justice, uh, love kindness, and walk humbly, walk humbly. And so for me, I I cannot allow as a leader that people are going to use uh, religion as a justification for discrimination. I could respect your religious freedoms, but also protect people from discrimination. And as I said in an earlier answer, 
I grew up in a household where my parents talked to me about how people used to use religion to justify the discrimination against African Americans. A more articulate, I I guess, uh, surreptitious answer, I should say, than Beto O'Rourke, but you can see what he's getting at there as well. He's willing to quote and twist. I mean, Scripture is very clear on these. Can we just be honest? Scripture is really clear on these issues. And everyone discriminates. The question is, what are you discriminating about? I I know people who won't eat at Chick-fil-A. I, I literally do know people who, I live down the street from someone who will not eat at Chick-fil-A. I, 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 there's someone in my, my office building who will not eat at Chick-fil-A because of the Christian values of its owners. They're discriminating against Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A is not actually discriminating against anyone. Anyone can go to Chick-fil-A. Anyone can work at Chick-fil-A. Anyone can get a Chick-fil-A franchise. They're discriminating against Chick-fil-A, but Cory Booker's okay with that. This is where the Democrats are, and they're not willing to speak up on China. These NBA players and these NBA all-stars and these NBA coaches, they're willing to speak out on America in the same way the Democrats are willing to come after your churches. They're willing to come after your schools. They're willing to come after your charities. They're willing to come after you if you're not down with the progressive agenda. They're not really that different from the Chinese in that respect. You know, I do take phone calls on this program, 877-97-ERIC. That translates to 877-973-7425. The University of Georgia and Georgia State University are uh, two of the top national value rankings for law schools. UGA Law is actually number one, second year in a row, based on cost, student debt, employment, and bar passage outcomes. Uh, Not a bad bad thing. It's, It's the national rankings. Um, I guess U.S. News and World Reports rankings. The Georgia State University's College of Law is number seven. I went to Mercer University's. Uh, well, it used to be the Walter F. George School of Law. And then during the whole movement to get rid of Confederate monuments and stuff, they stopped using Walter F. George name and they deny that it was because of that. And everybody knows it really was. Now it's just the Mercer University School of Law. It's the Walter F. George School of Law. Uh, he was a famous uh, senator, but um, the, the, the wackadoo leftists now who run rampant around that, that college, uh, in addition to impacting the bar passage rates and the education now fully into political correctness, and I'm still paying on law school. I don't even practice law anymore, and I am still paying for law school. Man, I should have gone to UGA. Or gone home to LSU, but I would have rather have stayed in Georgia and gone to UGA. Now, nonetheless, uh, good value. There is a story developing out of Georgia Southern that you should know about. It is starting to go viral on social media. I've been monitoring the story, and it's actually really um, an interesting situation. They had a lady speak at Georgia Southern. Her name is Janine Capo Cruce. She's Hispanic. I'm sorry, Latina. Um, and she used her appearance to address white privilege. I come here because I was invited and I talk about white privilege because it's a real thing that you are actually benefiting from right now and even asking the question. The newspaper quoted Cruce in response to someone critical of her remarks on the subject. Well, Some of the students, to protest her, burned her book on campus. Burned her book. And now there is an effort afoot to shame the students who participated. And, of course, she says she should be happy they they bought the book. But nope, she's not. She's she's outraged uh, that they're literally burning my novel. This is where we are, America. I'm sorry, but this is a woman who they showed up in a typically progressive fashion, insulted the kids who go to Georgia Southern. The Georgia Southern students got mad. They burned her book. At least they bought it. It's not like they took copies out of the library. They went and bought her book and then burned her book. I I, I don't I don't understand. What the problem is, 
I mean, it's ridiculous that students are burning the book, but it's ridiculous. The the university forced these students to sit through uh, a, a, a woman who wanted to stand there and insult them to their face on, on how privileged they are. Um, she's, she's written a book and a collection of essays on how feeling like an accidental American and the tectonic edges of identity in a society centered on whiteness. Sounds like she's the one with a chip on her shoulder. I mean, she's the daughter of Cuban refugees. She was raised in Miami and she has some animosity towards a culture that she believes is, is too white. You know, most Cuban refugee families I know, and I know a lot of them, uh, are love this country and are conservative and would disagree with her. And yet she went to Georgia Southern and wanted to insult the students to their faces. Uh, the university wanted it to happen, and the students got mad and protested. I, now, you know, if if students were to protest a conservative, everyone would be cheering them on. But they're protesting a progressive who wanted to lecture them on white privilege. And so suddenly there's a scandal and there's outrage. I don't understand why. I really don't. I think it's dumb to burn books, but I don't understand why. I thought students were supposed to protest. I thought protest was a good thing, freedom of speech and all that, but not when it's against a progressive. When we come back, I want to actually talk about a Georgia issue, and it's spreading over into North Carolina, Tennessee, Alabama as well. The decriminalization of marijuana in Georgia, the movement continues to grow. Just a quick time out to thank one of my favorite sponsors. And this week's sponsor, it's Quip. They make my electric toothbrush. I kid you not, I have used this toothbrush for several years now. I actually bought it. Um, it's, you know, a lot of times a sponsor to these podcasts, they send you their product and you get to use it. Quip, I'm an actual customer, have been a customer well before they sponsored the podcast. I love it because I've tried the really expensive, you know, you can get a $99 or more expensive um, fancy electric battery power toothbrush and they're terribly made uh, and they're not any better than the Quip. The Quip is only 25 bucks and it cleans your teeth. Not only that, it pulses every 30 seconds so you know when to change the position in your mouth. You get a new brush head every three months so you know, and the bar- brush heads are reasonably priced. It is a wonderful, wonderful invention, and they deliver the toothbrush head every three months on a schedule, so you keep your teeth clean, you keep your toothbrush looking new. It's great. It's only $25. You'll get your first brush head refill pack for free by going to getquip.com slash Erickson. It's a very simple way to support the show and a very simple way to get a great, great, great toothbrush. Listen, you don't need all sorts of connected apps and and Wi-Fi-enabled toothbrushes. You just need a good battery-powered, great toothbrush, and that's what you get with Quip. Go to getquip.com slash Erickson. You'll get your first refill for free. Go right now, getquip.com slash Erickson. Get, the word get, G-E-T, Q-U-I-P dot com slash Erickson. Hello and welcome. It is Eric Erickson here. The Eric Erickson Show. You can call in if you want to be a part of the program. 877-97-ERIC, 877-973-7425. Oh, TGIF. And the weather outside is delightful. Did you know I I saw a weather forecast in, in Houston, Texas today? Not Houston, but Houston, Texas. Uh, it's 80 degrees at 8 a.m. It was 80 degrees at 8 a.m. And by noon, it's going to be 60. That's impressive. Um, here, man, across the state, it is beautiful. In Macon right now, my goodness, the weather forecast is is just absolutely stunning. We've got blue skies. And where are we right now? 66 degrees at my house in Macon. With a high of 83. Tomorrow, it's not. It's going to be 85 and sunny. It'll be perfect for my kids' soccer game. Carrollton is 64 right now. Yeah, I, I yeah, I'm, I'm actually doing this. Atlanta is 66. Adairsville is 67. Holy moly! Um, it's just it, they're they, only down in far south Georgia right now. Those of you listening in Valdosta right now, uh, it is it is above 70 degrees. Wow just it's nice that fall is finally here is it not okay uh we we need to move into some news I, i'll get to impeachment here in a little bit there really isn't major turn of events uh there there's some stuff out there uh worth getting to but oh wait hang on a second oh whoa hang on oh this is this is actually oh this this just happened this this just happened 
Um, this is the uh, district, of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit. Um, the U.S. Court of Appeals has rejected Donald Trump's appeal of the House Oversight Committee subpoena for his financial records. The D.C. Circuit upheld the lower court decision um, that uh, the subpoena was valid. The decision was two to one. Uh, Naomi Rao, who is a Trump appointed judge, uh, dissented. The other two judges, I'm not sure who appointed them, um, are, um, oof, they, they, this is actually a big blow for the president and it's happening right now. He will have to, unless the Supreme Court intervenes, he will have to hand over his financial records to the House of Representatives. Um, Judge Tattel was appointed by Bill Clinton. He is 77 years old. Now, he is the lead judge uh, on this. Ouch. Yeah, this is kind of a a big deal for the president. Uh, This comes as people are beginning also to question uh, who is paying Rudy Giuliani right now, who continues to just get the president in trouble. In fact, the president is beginning to distance himself, it would seem, from Rudy Giuliani. This isn't even what I wanted to talk about out of the gate, but this is big breaking news happening right now. And that's what you rely on me for. The president of the United States, well... It was reported. Are you concerned that Rudy Giuliani could be indicted in all of this? Well, I hope not. Again, I don't know how he knows these people. They're his what? They're his clients. Okay, well, then they're clients. I mean, you know, he's got a lot of clients. So I just don't know. I haven't spoken to Rudy about it. I don't know. I will say this. From what I heard, I just heard about this. They said, we have nothing to do with it. We're totally, we have nothing to do with it. I don't know those gentlemen. Now, it's possible I have a picture with him because I have a picture with everybody. I have a picture with everybody here. In fairness, he had dinner with them at the White House at Rudy Giuliani's request. But uh, somebody said there may be a picture or something where at a fundraiser or somewhere. Uh, so, But I have pictures with everybody. I, have, I don't know if there's anybody I don't have pictures. I don't know them. Uh, I don't know about them. I don't know what they do. But uh, I don't know. Maybe they were clients of Rudy. You'd have to ask Rudy. I just don't know. And this a lot of people in the White House took this as the president beginning to distance himself from Rudy Giuliani. And I think that's a fair read. Uh, Rudy Giuliani has brought scandal not just to the president, uh, but to other Republicans. Uh, these Ukrainian men who were arrested with one-way tickets to Vienna, Austria. By the way, Rudy Giuliani himself was flying to Vienna um, and wound up not going, apparently. Um, these gentlemen were arrested at the airport trying to leave the country, uh, knowing they were expected in Washington, D.C. yesterday to testify before the House of Representatives. They were attempting to flee the country on Wednesday night so that they would not have to show up at the House of Representatives to answer testimony from Democrats. You know, um, this is continuing to spiral, and every time it spirals and there is damage done to the president, it's because of Rudy Giuliani. Uh, Every single thing that Rudy has done thus far has harmed the president. I mean, everything Rudy Giuliani has done has harmed the president at this time. And the president sounds like he's finally getting a clue on this and walking away from him, which is a good thing. Now, we'll get back to this. I I, want to spend a few minutes. There's a story in the Atlanta Journal. And this is really impacting North Carolina, the, the Republicans control the legislature, but you got uh, a a progressive Democrat for governor, and you've got increasingly progressive enclaves, the the Raleigh-Durham area, you've got the uh, Asheville area and the like, and they're they're increasingly there and here in Georgia, and now even in, in places like Charleston, South Carolina, they are considering decriminalizing marijuana. The movement is really growing in certain enclaves around Atlanta. In particular, you've got uh, Clarkston. Uh, Ted Terry, who is the mayor of Clarkston, has been a big advocate of legalizing recreational marijuana and at a minimum decriminalizing it. Now, what decriminalization means essentially is that if you were caught with less than an ounce of marijuana, uh, you cannot be charged with a crime. 
And there's a big push to make this happen in many Georgia cities. And at the same time, we're increasingly mindful that much of the the spin on marijuana over the last 30 and 40 years uh, from normal and other uh, pro-pot advocacy groups, it doesn't necessarily hold up because just as tobacco growers over time grew tobacco that was increasingly addictive, the same holds true for marijuana, where the strains of marijuana are increasingly potent uh, and increasingly likely to lead to addiction. And in some cases, uh, breeders want an addictive response to marijuana. And uh, there really isn't a ton of data out there because it's been illegal. It hasn't been so uh, terribly studied. We're seeing more and more people show signs of addiction. Uh, we're also seeing more and more people having reactions to um high potency marijuana, but uh, that's not stopping people in Georgia from trying to advocate for this. Uh, 11% of the state population, according to the AJC, now live in a place where in most cases they won't be jailed if found with less than an ounce of pot. Uh, Marijuana decriminalization laws eliminate or reduce legal penalties for possession. Under current state law, punishment can be a year and a thousand dollar fine. Though possession of a small amount remains a misdemeanor in Georgia, individual cities and criminals are able to partially decriminalize the offense by setting their own penalties. So you've got this this weird situation in Chambly, uh, in Metro Atlanta, you can get a citation and seventy five dollar fine for possessing less than an ounce of marijuana. Go across the road into Brookhaven, and you could end up a year in jail for having less than an ounce of marijuana. It's becoming an issue around the state. There are a lot of people who are trying to get the law changed. What I find so interesting here is essentially you have progressive communities in Georgia doing this, breaking down the barriers. I mean, in Athens, Clark County, I'm I'm broadcasting out of my flagship station in Athens, uh, WGAU, and in Athens now, uh, the police are saying if they catch you with an ounce or less because of the hemp situation, um, the state legalized hemp. There is no test to determine whether or not what you're carrying is hemp or marijuana. Everyone knows that what you're carrying is marijuana because no one is carrying around a little plastic baggie of hemp. Everybody knows it, but the police are wink, wink, nod, nod, saying we can't test it yet. We don't have the 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 test. Oh, hush up, Siri, uh, to be able to test the strength. So they're they're going to save it, and they may come back and arrest you later once they've tested it. But uh, yeah, you now I was actually in, in Athens just a while back in a much more open use of marijuana in parts of Atlanta. You can walk downtown in Atlanta now. And even in Macon, where I am, the drive through at the McDonald's with the high school kids smoking. I, I actually got gas the other day very near me. There's a uh, Flash Foods um, right. Uh, I mean, so there's a Flash Foods outside my neighborhood has a Dairy Queen with it. And in the afternoons, if you go to the Dairy Queen and you're in the drive through you will see the young male employees at the Dairy Queen standing out back smoking weed. I, I kid you not. Uh, and inevitably, if you go in the afternoon, all your orders are going to be wrong. And, and I'm not making that up either. Uh, we went through the other day, and it was it was the weirdest experience. I mean, it, it was like a, it, watching a stoner movie. The, 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 these guys were in the back. They were, they were all smoking weed. Each of them had their own joint. You can smell the marijuana. Uh, and then they go back inside. The line is backed up. Uh, they, they finished, they all finished their collective smoke break. They go back inside to start making the orders. And I'm sure everybody else in line was messed up because our order was completely messed up by these guys. But they, literally all of the employees, uh, I, I saw a big sign the other day. They were having a management meeting over there. And last week we went through and, and the drive through was shut down. You had to go inside to order. It was the it was the craziest thing. I kid you not, though. I've seen this on multiple occasions. And same with uh, the, the McDonald's employees down the street from us were at that Flash Foods uh, hanging out. Uh, they're all smoking weed together just openly. And in Macon, we haven't decriminalized. In, in Macon, we haven't lowered the penalties. But it is, it's become that flagrant in society. And one of the things that always frustrates me uh, in society is the argument that, well, everybody's doing it, so let's just make it legal. And I, I do think that individual cities have the power, because I'm a federalist, 
to to make their decision here. But I also think that if everybody's doing it, that's not necessarily an excuse. I, I will tell you, everybody is going 80 miles an hour on I-16 to Savannah. I think the DOT should increase the speed limit on I-16. Have you ever driven down I-16, just, just as an aside? Have you all ever driven down I-16 to Savannah? Because that is an interstate that could be Georgia's Autobahn. You really, you, they should just get rid of the speed limit. Put a speed limit in in Dublin, uh, but otherwise, and no speed limit all the way to Statesboro. There, there, there need be no speed limit on that interstate. It is, uh, you can go 100 miles an hour on that interstate. I have seen people go, I have not. I, 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 I promise, I, I, I absolutely promise, I have never been 100 miles an hour uh, or higher. <laughs> I'll say that, or higher on, I see maybe 90, but I've never been to 100. I have been, I was going 90 miles an hour one time on I-16. I, I genuinely was and had someone blow past me in a um, in a sports car. I don't understand why we don't have that as an Autobahn in Georgia. But nonetheless, I mean, if we're going to make the argument that everybody's doing it, so we might as well make it legal. Uh, we, everybody's speeding on I-16 and I-75, I-85 and I-20. We might as well raise the speed limit again. But on this issue, I, I see where progressive communities are beginning to do this, and they're trying to cause a problem for the state where the state must get involved and advance recreational marijuana. And th there is a reason. There is a reason, and you need to know, it is a very specific political reason. Polling suggests, reality does not, you do need to understand reality doesn't because they're all too baked to show up and vote. Uh, but polling suggests younger voters will get up and go to the polls and vote for candidates who support legalization of recreational marijuana. So by manufacturing this crisis of having every progressive enclave in Georgia decriminalize it, uh, escalating the spread of it to everybody's doing it to we need the legislature to now step in because we got all these potheads who they're going to go to jail if you don't do something. So you need to change the law and, and legalize recreational marijuana. They're, they're trying to manufacture this to get the legislature to act. And what they're hoping is that young voters will show up at the polls and vote. The problem is we actually do know from a variety of states now, from California, Oregon, Washington, Alaska, Colorado, uh, Florida, uh, it, it actually has been older voters who went and voted on this issue. The young people are too baked uh, to wake up in the morning and, and go to the polls and vote. Uh, they get high, they go to bed, and, and they don't wake up to go vote. I, I'm not, not actually making that up. I'm being somewhat flippant. But, yeah, it is the young stoners don't go vote. It's, it's the old hippies who've been advocating for it since the 60s who are the ones who are actually casting the vote. And I don't know that there are enough of them in Georgia to actually shape the conversation. So what you've got are these little progressive enclaves trying to, to do this, hoping to stimulate the vote for the Democrats. I don't know that there are enough votes there for the Democrats to be able to do it. But it's just another way that progressivism has tried to disrupt the system in order to get its way, uh, whether it's it's on gay rights or on legalization of marijuana or you name it. Uh, they disrupt the system and then they say, well, everybody's doing it. You might as well make it legal. You might as well accept it. And then they bully and control until you do. If you want to be a part of the program, you can call in and say hi, 877-97-ERIC, 877-973-7425. I mentioned in the last hour this situation at Georgia Southern University, a, a left-wing speaker on campus who wanted to lecture the students uh, about their white privilege. And students reacted, uh, apparently their first year experience program, freshman year, F F the FYE program, I think that's first year experience, had to read this woman's book on essentially how uh, she she sees this country as a shameful bastion of whiteness and she's progressive and wanted to lecture all these kids on their white identity and white per, um, white privilege. They responded by buying copies of her book and burning it. <laughs> Listen, I'm opposed to book burning. Uh, I, I like books too much to burn them. I have a hard time uh, letting go of books. I, but if it was anything else, uh, they would be cheered. Well, I, I, I mentioned it last hour. You should know that there are people now circulating the videos of the students who live streamed the book burning. And they are trying to target shame and harass the students who burned the book, uh, they will not let it go, of course. 
Uh, these kids may ruin uh, their careers long term because the left is out to shame them uh, and ruin them. Pitiful. Um, <laughs> so much grace. So much grace. Now, uh, we need to turn our sights to the president and we and his rally last night. I have a lot of audio I want to wade through on the president's rally. I want to begin uh, with this. I think your very weak mayor made a mistake when he took them on. As you know, for many years, leaders in Washington brought large numbers of refugees to your state from Somalia without considering the impact on schools and communities and taxpayers. I promise you that as president, I would give local communities a greater say in refugee policy and put in place enhanced vetting and responsible immigration controls. And I've done that. Since coming into office, I have reduced refugee resettlement by 85%. And as you know, maybe especially in Minnesota, I kept another promise. I issued an executive action making clear that no refugees will be resettled in any city or any state without the express written consent of that city or that state. So speak to your mayor. You should be able to decide what is best for your own cities and for your own neighborhoods, and that's what you have the right to do right now. And believe me, no other president would be doing that. There you go. Uh, making refugee a big issue. The, coming on the heels of the Kurd situation, it played well in the crowd last night. Uh, we'll see how far it goes in that situation. Uh, but this is also a big deal because the Democrats are trying to force, essentially, the Democrats have come out very strongly, all the Democratic candidates, on requiring local cities to take refugees, whether they want them or not. Uh, the president was on a real roll last night I at his rally. I want to talk about that some when we come back, including there is one thing th that happened at his rally last night. I, I, I reached out to the White House. You should know in full disclosure. I reached out to the White House and told them I personally think that we need um, more of this. We need more rallies from the president. We need, he, he clearly had a good time last night and we should have more of this, but you do need to know that there's one thing I also told them. I hope that they don't do any more of that. I thought was rather bad form. I'll talk about that when we come back and you can call in eight seven seven nine seven three seven four two five. It is 35 after the hour. I am Eric Erickson, and this is my show, and you can call in and be a part of it if you like, 877-97-ERIC, 877-973-7425. A uh, bunch of people have sent me, man, I, I didn't realize I had as many listeners in Pickens County as I do, but uh, and subscribers to the newspaper, no less, have sent me ads on Wise 103 there. Yes, I am. Uh, and across the state of Georgia, happy to be here. Now, can we get into the president's rally last night? He he got on stage, and he did uh, talk about the Syrian pullout. I, I'm gonna. This clip is almost five minutes long, and I am going to to talk over it. Just be prepared as I talk over the president. The wall, and they would have forced me to build it. I would have. Oh. Under this administration, we are also ending the endless wars. We have to do it, folks. We have to do it. We should, except you're not doing that, and that's the problem. We have totally defeated the ISIS caliphate, and I did that in rather quick time, if you remember. But, Mr. President, man, I'm voting for you, but that's just not true. In fact, they're escaping from prison today. They, they actually are, literally. Uh, multiple reports are confirming that Turkey has come in 
uh, invaded the area where the Kurds were holding ISIS for us. We're not there to help the Kurds, and they're escaping from prison now. Because we have the greatest fighting machine now. When I came in, it was totally depleted. We have great generals. We have great war fighters. And they did it so fast. I flew to Iraq. I met with the generals, right? I met with the generals. I said, I hear it's going to take a year to two years. Sir, we could do it in two weeks. I said, what? <laughs> they don't let us fight, sir. They don't let us fight. We want to fight. They don't let us fight. You know, said, one great thing he fight. did do was change the rules of engagement I so said, they can be more aggressive. They say it's going to take anywhere from a year to two years. You say you can do it so quickly. He said, sir, we're going to hit him from the front. We're going to hit him from the back. We're going to hit him from the sides, from underground, from overground. We're going to hit the hell out of him. And they did. And we won very quickly. But what do we, we didn't kill them all. See, this is the problem. We didn't kill them all. We rounded, we probably should have, uh, but we rounded them up and put them in detainment facilities in northern Syria and Iraq. And we were helping the Kurds contain them. And now we're not there. The Kurds are dying. So there's no one there to keep them in jail. But from now on, we want to fight where it is to the benefit of the United States of America, not to the benefit of other countries. And we will only fight to win. We're only going to fight to win. We don't fight to win. We don't fight to win. The Turks have been fighting with the Kurds for two centuries. And Turkey, as you know, is a NATO ally. But I've been rough on them. We've defeated 100% of that ISIS caliphate and no longer have any troops in the area. We don't have any troops. The troops have been pulled out where Turkey is carrying out now a very tough campaign against the Kurds. Get them out. Yeah, you can hear the protester yelling in the background about all of this. By the way, let, let me just play this. I'll bring the microphone down. This is one of the great things you love about the whether Democrat or Republican, the protesters so and the crowd reaction. Right now waging a very tough campaign against the Kurds. We got along with the Kurds, and we help the Kurds. And don't forget, they're also fighting for their land. You know that, but they're fighting. So we have three choices. You ready? Here are the three choices. We don't have any soldiers there because we've left. We won. We left. Take but- victory. I'm, I'm. Listen, hang on. United States. Take the victory, United States. But we didn't. And see, that that's that's the disheartening thing here. As someone who, who's voting for the president and thinks he screwed up, we didn't leave. We just went a couple hundred miles south. We left that area. We didn't leave Syria. And he wants to claim that we've pulled them out of Syria, but we haven't. We just went south. So the Turks could kill the Kurds. We left. Take a victory. Take a victory. Bring our troops back home. I told the story yesterday. I have to sign letters. It's the hardest thing I have to do. I sign letters. Dear Mr. and Mrs. Smith from Arkansas. Dear Mr. and Mrs. Jones from Alabama. Dear Mr. and Mrs. Somebody from some great state, I'm sorry to inform you, your son has been killed in combat. I'm so sorry. And every letter is individually done because sometimes the parents, they're grieving and they get together with other parents and they get, and I don't want to see that it's like the same letter. So we do different letters. It's the hardest thing I have to do. (laughs) Hardest thing. It's the hardest thing I have. I was telling Tom Cotton, it's the hardest thing that I have to do. And I signed those letters and it it just, uh, it it breaks your heart. And then, and by the way, there's a time to fight. Nobody fights harder than I do, but there's a time and there's not necessarily a time. But I send these letters out, quite a few. And sometimes I send letters out. It's called Blue on Green, where we're teaching people how to fight. And then they turn the gun on our soldiers and shoot them in the back. And that's the hardest thing for a parent. I have all of them. I know every one. That's the hardest thing for a parent when they get notification because they learn how their child has died. When the so-called people that we're teaching how to fight 
turned the gun on them. And we've had a lot of that, a lot of it in Afghanistan, more than we've ever had proportionately before. It's a horrible, horrible place. But we have it but with have the Kurds. And sometimes I go out to a place, Dover Air Force Base. It's a very tough experience. Mike Pence goes, I go. Okay, listen. I think the president got this wrong. And I don't think he's helping himself in being dishonest about it to the crowd. And I I think that most of the people there probably get it. The Kurds that we were allied with in northern Syria who are now, as I am talking to you, dying because the Turks have invaded and are hunting them down and killing them, they weren't nice people. They weren't. Many groups classify them as a terror organization. Our State Department has done so in the past. They're they're not nice people. But they were our allies on the ground. And they were protecting Christians in northern Syria from extermination. They were killing ISIS. They were killing Syrian bad guys. They were helping us fight Russian mercenaries. And they were keeping Christians alive and safe. And now they're being killed. And so because they're being killed, ISIS is getting out of jail. They're breaking out. They actually are breaking out. Uh, This is not my speculation. This is now confirmed. This is happening. Uh, ISIS soldiers are breaking out of detainment facilities. Uh, Christians are going to be killed. They are fleeing the area as quickly as they can. Many of the Christians who were being protected by the Kurds are now trying to make their way to Damascus, uh, where Basar al-Assad understands he can get some street cred by protecting the Christians. So we are having a bunch of people who were pro-America now going into the arms of the Russians and the Syrians. This doesn't end the endless wars. The president did not bring the soldiers home. It, 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 we, we should be honest, at least, about what's going on here. We're not ending the endless war. I think we should. I, th- I think we should come home from Afghanistan. I think we've been there long enough. It's clear we're, we're not really stabilizing the area. Everyone's just kind of waiting for us to pack up and leave. We might as well pack up and leave. But we had 100 soldiers in northern Syria. 100. That's not a disputed number. Everyone agrees it was just 100 military advisors special operators in northern Syria. And what did we get with those 100 soldiers? What what, what did we get? We got ISIS contained. We got the Christians protected. And we got a corridor in northern Syria that had become a safe haven for people because no one would attack it because they didn't want to risk killing one of these 100 American soldiers. That's a heck of a return on investment for just having 100 soldiers there. We don't have an entire division. We we, we don't have the entire army there. We have 100 soldiers. They're spread out, and so no one attacked that area. It was safe. Now those soldiers are gone, and the, the Kurds who were allied with us there are dying. The Turks have come in. The ISIS prisoners are able to escape. In fact, we knew it was going to happen. It's an admission against interest on our part that two of the the ISIS ringleaders we took with us. They were British expats who went and helped helped ISIS organize its military. We've taken them with us. Uh, The rest of the ISIS soldiers are there. And they're escaping now. And they're escaping back into Iraq. They're escaping into Syria. They're escaping into Turkey. They may make their way to Europe. Uh, Erdogan, the Turkish president, has threatened to to unleash the refugees and the people fleeing Syria onto Europe. He, by the way, is, is not really our friend. I realize that Turkey is our NATO ally. and I wonder how much longer they can stay in NATO. Uh, they're increasingly working with the Russians and undermining our interests. I just think we need to be honest about it. I think many of us who are voting for the president in 2020 are voting for the president because we look at him and there are lots of things we don't care for, but we look at the Democrats and there are lots of things um, we worry about greatly like this. This is from your LGBTQ plan, and here's what you write. This is a quote. Freedom of religion is a fundamental right, but it should not be used to discriminate. Do you think religious institutions uh, like 
colleges, churches, charities, should they lose their tax-exempt status if they oppose same-sex marriage? Yes. There can be no reward, no benefit, no tax break for anyone or inst any institution, any organization in America that denies the full human rights and the full civil rights of every single one of us. And so as president, we're going to make that a priority and we are going to stop those who are infringing upon the human rights of our fellow Americans. So there are a lot of people who are going to vote for Donald Trump, uh, despite his flaws, because it's pretty clear the Democrats really are out to get us. I mean, Elizabeth Warren at the event, uh, at the CNN event, came out for forcing taxpayers to pay for the uh, sex reassignment surgeries of transgender prisoners. Yeah, I'm not making that up. She, she actually did that. Um, the, the, praising the... Um, praising the nine-year-old who is, claims she is a boy. And then, of course, uh, there is Cory Booker who says something like this. Well, first of all, very clearly, uh, it's, it is a national emergency. The majority of the terrorist attacks in this country since 9-11 have been right-wing extremist groups. The majority of them have been uh, white supremacists and hate groups. And, and I will elevate as, as president of the United States an office on hate crimes and white supremacy to make sure it is a presidential level effort to, contact, to protect our country as a whole. But I'm not stopping there. We need to have a Department of Justice that recognizes this is a problem and investigates hate crimes. We must, we must take the steps necessary to keep these weapons out of the hands of people that are doing those crimes. Now, what's so interesting here is the man who asked the question uh, was a victim at the Pulse nightclub shooting. That was a, a shooting done by an Islamic radical affiliated with ISIS, whose members are now uh, breaking out of prisons in northern Syria. And Cory Booker decided that it was right-wing violence. It, it was a, a, some white radical Trump supporter who shot up the Pulse nightclub as opposed to a member of ISIS. When you hear stuff like that, yeah, I, I, I think e even if you don't like the president, and, you know, there's lots of things about the president. I, I don't, we've talked on the phone. We have a cordial relationship. But I, I'm, there are lots of things I'm critical of with this president. But it, I think you got to at least understand why people, particularly evangelicals, are sticking with President Trump on this. Because you got Democrats out there now who are coming for their churches, who are coming for their schools, who are coming for their hospitals, who are coming for their adoption agencies, who are coming for their nonprofits, who aren't willing to recognize that uh, Islamic radicalism is a bad thing, who blame radical Islamic terrorist attacks on uh, white people and Trump supporters, and who say all these things. So, of course, there are people who are looking at this and saying, who am I going to vote for? Now, some will say, Jesus is Lord. I'm sitting it out. And I I'm sympathetic to him. I largely did that in 2016, but most Americans disagreed. And, you know, I'm not going to sit out this election. I'm not. And if I got to choose between a Democrat who hates me and wants to destroy my church or Donald Trump, who I don't particularly care for, but at least isn't out to get me, I know who I'm voting for. And I got to tell you, when I hear Democrats dripping with condescension for traditional marriage and dripping with condescension over over Christian charities and downplaying Islamic radicalism, claiming it's, it's right-wing violence, I, I got to tell you, I think that there are a lot of voters in Florida and Wisconsin and Pennsylvania and Michigan states Donald Trump's got to win who he can make a play for him. He can. There is one troubling data point on that front, though, and we should review... Uh, the latest data points when it comes to this presidential election, because there's one number that has been consistent and it's consistent across polls. So we we do need to talk about one polling data point uh, that continues to crop up in a lot of the polls. It has been super consistent in the Marist poll uh, and the Marist poll has been asking this since January. In the 2020 election, uh, will you vote for or against President Trump? 
52% of voters in the polling say they will vote against President Trump. 52%. Um, the number has been above 51% in every poll out there. And that's got to trouble people. Well, I know it does, in fact, trouble people in the White House. And I want to be very clear here. One of the things that we're starting to see out there is a movement among some of the Trump supporters to say that polling is all a lie, uh, that polling is designed to convince you of something. You've never gotten polled, therefore it must all be a lie. I actually have gotten polled uh, from a couple of different polling firms. I, I'm, I'm one of the few people I know who has gotten the phone call. Uh, but in a nation of 350 million people, when they're only polling 350 people doing a statistical sampling or 500 people, yeah, listen, um, I ran campaigns. I was a campaign manager. I was a campaign consultant. I designed mail. I designed TV. I, I helped do the TV commercials. I, I did the polling. And I believe that by and large, pollsters try to get it right. They're not trying to shape the news. They're trying to reflect it. I think that news uh, news organizations, to their detriment, rely on the polling to shape the news. But I'm not a conspiracist uh, when it comes to major polling companies. I think they try to get it right. And you see when it is when Democrats are doing badly in the polls, Democrats are the ones who go out and they say, well, the, the polls are all wrong. The polls are designed to shape this narrative. It's, it's, it's a bias against us in the polling. The polling's all wrong. Here's our internal polling, and our internal polling shows something completely opposite. And when Republicans are the ones who the polling's going against, they do the same thing. And I'm seeing this with Trump supporters already coming out saying, oh, the polling, the polling's designed to shape the narrative. The polling's not to tr try to get an accurate reflection. Um, please don't buy the delusion. Because I assure you the president's team is taking is doing in-depth polling as well. And the Republicans are doing in-depth polling. And I've said all along, when we come back, we do need to talk about impeachment updates. Uh, and I, I have said all along that what's going to happen is the um, we're going to see the Senate Republicans turn on the president if they believe that their majority is in jeopardy. And right now, one of the most consistent things in polling, besides 51 to 52 percent of people intend to actively vote against the president, is that 53 to 54 percent of people want the Republicans to keep the Senate. As long as that number holds stable, the president probably is in no jeopardy of getting impeached. But when that number starts to change, the odds of the president getting impeached go up. But don't, please don't buy the mythology. And I, I can hear you. I can hear you right now listening to this and screaming at the radio. You're trying to reach to turn it off because I'm upsetting you by saying this. And you're saying the polling was wrong in 2016. You're there. I know you're there. But Hillary Clinton won the popular vote in 2016. The pollsters did not contemplate a scenario where Hillary Clinton could win the popular vote and lose the Electoral College. I assure you they won't make that mistake this time. It doesn't mean they'll get it precisely right, but it at least gives you a picture of what's going on. And you don't have to believe me in this. Just look at the behavior of the candidates. Look at the behavior of the Republicans in Washington. There is a lot of polling that has been going on since July about impeachment. And it has consistently shown Republicans stand with the president. But what it has shown through August, September, and October is that increasingly there are some Republicans willing to at least consider impeachment. And you're starting to see Senate Republicans go wobbly as that number increases. And we're going to have to keep an eye on this. When we come back, it looks like the whistleblower worked for Joe Biden, and that will give some resolve to the Republicans in Congress. I'll give you the latest on impeachment and where we stand. Just a quick time out to thank one of my favorite sponsors. And this week's sponsor, it's Quip. They make my electric toothbrush. I kid you not, I have used this toothbrush for several years now. I actually bought it. Um, it's, you know, a lot of times a sponsor to these podcasts, they send you their product and you get to use it. 
Quip, I'm an actual customer, have been a customer well before they sponsored the podcast. I love it because I've tried the really expensive, you know, you can get a $99 or more expensive um, fancy electric battery powered toothbrush and they're terribly made uh, and they're not any better than the Quip. The Quip is only 25 bucks and it cleans your teeth. Not only that, it pulses every 30 seconds so you know when to change the position in your mouth. You get a new brush head every three months so you know, and the bar- brush heads are reasonably priced. It is a wonderful, wonderful invention, and they deliver the toothbrush head every three months on a schedule. So you keep your teeth clean. You keep your toothbrush looking new. It's great. It's only $25. You'll get your first brush head refill pack for free by going to getquip.com slash Erickson. It's a very simple way to support the show. And a very simple way to get a great, great, great toothbrush. Listen, you don't need all sorts of connected apps and and Wi-Fi enabled toothbrushes. You just need a good battery powered, great toothbrush. And that's what you get with Quip. Go to G-E-T-Q-U-I-P dot com slash Erickson. You'll get your first refill for free. Go right now. Get Quip dot com slash Erickson. Get the word get G E T Q U I P dot com slash Erickson. Hello, welcome. It's Eric Erickson here. The Eric Erickson Show. The phone number 877 Eric. 877 973 Why? Because I spell my name E R I C K. The whistleblower appears to have worked for Joe Biden. While Joe Biden was vice president. We are being assured, assured that it was in a professional capacity while Joe Biden served as vice president of the United States. And I don't know why you would not believe uh, the assertions of the American press corps. I, I just, I have no idea why you might be skeptical that the American press corps might not be giving us the full story. I just don't know why you would think that this, that's what we know at this time, the, the whistleblower, um, he, well, you know, man, Donald Trump went after Joe Biden last night. I, 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 I'm believe I can play this on the program. I mean, my goodness, it it was all over the place last night. Meanwhile, Biden allowed China to rip off America for eight years as vice president and Barack Obama let him just rob us blind. And we're not doing that anymore. Those days are over. The Bidens got rich. And that is substantiated. While America got robbed. That's what happened. Sleepy Joe and his friends sold out America. They didn't have tough negotiations. I look at these trade deals and I say, who the hell could have done this? If you didn't, if you had no business instinct, no business ability, if you had nothing, if you're dumb as hell, you wouldn't make these deals. They're so bad. I say, who made these deals? Who made these deals? But we're ripping them all up and redoing them and they're going to be very good. Wait till you see what happens in... There you go. Yeah, that that was the say. He also um, said Biden was a good vice president because he kept kissing Barack Obama's backside. Uh, he, he was rather blunt. I do have to say, just just as an aside, oh, I, I got to play the Peter Strzok clip from the rally last night. But I got to say, um, I, I I never really had a huge problem with the Republicans at Trump rallies chanting "lock her up," referring to Hillary Clinton because who doesn't want to lock up Hillary Clinton? Um, I mean, even Bill, I think w- w- wouldn't be, you have a problem with it. <laughs> I tease, I tease. Um, I, I, I never really had a problem with it. Uh, Hillary Clinton, I think did get away with, uh, server stuff. She shouldn't have gotten away with, but I, I, I do have to, to say that, I thought it was bad form last night to have Eric Trump start chanting lock him up about Joe Biden's son. Uh, One, there really isn't any allegation at all that the vice president's son broke a law. It was highly unethical. Uh, And I do think that there are a lot of questions that need to be asked about Joe Biden's son profiting uh, when Joe Biden had certain business. Uh, I absolutely think there needs to be a question on that. And the media is covering for them. 
but it's just it, it seems it's a very bad form to me. I think to have the the son the the son of the sitting president Channing lock him up about the son of a political rival, particularly when that political rival leads a party that also wants to lock up the president's son for the exact same things that he's accusing Hunter Biden of. It just it comes across as very third world. Now, this is not Mugabe's America. It's not Hugo Chavez's America. I just don't think we need to do that. That that being said though, the president going after Joe Biden was rather funny. <laughs> and also the Peter Strzok comment, the Lisa Page stuff. Listen to this. The president clearly having a good time last night at the rally. That doesn't know how to write the truth. Published a story and in this case they might have gotten it pretty correct. They said the campaign to impeach President Trump has begun. That was the headline. Little did we know they weren't playing games. Think of that. That was 19 minutes after the oath of office. Months earlier, Peter struck. Remember, he and his lover, Lisa Page, what a group. She's going to win. Ten million to one, she's going to win. I'm telling you, Peter. I'm telling you, Peter, she's going to win. Peter, oh, I love you so much. I love you, Peter. I love you too, Lisa. Lisa, I love you. Lisa. Lisa. Oh, God, I love you, Lisa. And if she doesn't win, Lisa, we've got an insurance policy, Lisa. We'll get that son of a bitch out. We got an insurance policy. And we're living through the insurance policy. That's what it is. The phony Russia hoax. <laughs> you listen, listen, I, I, I have blue check mark reporters livid with me for saying the president needs to do more of these rallies. How do you find that edifice? How, how, how can you see the president doing that? Yeah, you should be ashamed of yourself for saying the president needs to. Y'all, I'm telling you, it does him good. It does the president good to get out there on the campaign trail and do this sort of stuff. It, it really does. Um, I, 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 I reached out to friends who were involved in his campaign and I said, get him out there more. I mean, when the president stays in the White House and, and he's in that bubble, he gets on Twitter and he lashes out at the media and they, oh, the, the president, this is about impeachment. The, the president is, is, he's horrified of impeachment. He's horrified of what's coming. The, the, the president needs to, he, he needs to do something that the president, he's just, he, he, this is all about impeachment. Well, he gets out on the campaign trail and suddenly they got a, they got a, <laughs> they got to cover his comments on struck and page. They, they got to cover his comments on Joe Biden. And it's not all about, he brings up the insurance policy and they, they got to avoid talking about that. So they can't talk about impeachment. It does him good to be out there. It helps him. You know, I mentioned the other day, the president's superpower has always been that he can go out on the campaign trail and he can say something. And it completely distracts the media. And in their distraction, they're forced to cover whatever it is the president wants them to cover. They can't avoid it. They, they, they have to cover whatever it is the president is talking about. But with impeachment, when he gets on Twitter and he starts blowing people up, what the media gets to do is they get to say, oh, he's come unhinged. He, he's unglued over impeachment. And this is all about impeachment. Well, he, they can't do that so much. Now, he gets to, like, for example, the media, here, here's a Washington Post tweet from a minute ago. Trump's hostility to refugees back at center of his political rhetoric. Yes. The president is now suddenly taking the lead and changing the conversation. And the media is forced to cover it. And that's not a bad thing. Not a bad thing at all. Get him out on the campaign trail where he does this and he sets the agenda. And by the way, I, I got to tell you, the, the Democrats are helping the president on this. The Democrats are adamantly helping the president on this with their ridiculous nonsense last night on CNN. Listen to Amy Klobuchar the senator from Minnesota who isn't even polling well enough to be in the next Democratic debate. Hi, Hi. good evening. 
I currently identify as non-binary. In California, I am able to change my gender to X. However, on the federal level, there is no such option. Will you recognize third gender markers on the federal level? Yes. Thank you. I will. Um, and I think there's also, I, you know, I think that there is a lot of work we need to do all over the country with driver's licenses, as you know. Uh, not every state has some of the provisions that California have in place and just work on a state by state basis uh, to make those changes. Oh, good grief. Come on. Uh, you're a boy or a girl. Um, the party of science is rejecting science on this. It is a faith issue for them. It's nonsensical to upend our entire society so that a a, uh, a tenth of a percentage point of people can feel good about themselves is silly. But the, the larger thing is so much of this is stuff outside the control of the federal government, and yet they want to do it. And then, of course, there's Kamala Harris's pandering last night on stage. And my pronouns right. are she, her, and hers. She, her, and hers. Mine too. All right. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, by the way, did you hear that from Chris Cuomo? He, l- just l- w- one more time. And my All pronouns right. are she, her, and hers. She, her, and hers. Mine too. <laughs> All right. She's like, all, all right. <laughs> Oh, Chris Cuomo is such an idiot. I mean, he really is. He, he's the dumb Cuomo. Uh, so many people. He, by the way, people inside CNN refer to him as the dumb Cuomo. Uh, <laughs> he had to come out and apologize afterwards. Uh, I was just caught up in the moment. I'm so sorry. Please don't be offended by me saying that my j- pronouns are, are her, hers, and she. I'm so sorry. It's, 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 it takes a lot of energy to be a progressive, does it not? This, this whole nonsense, uh, uh, pick, pick your pronouns. None of this is scientific, by the way. None of this is, is based in science. This is all a, 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 a cult of the modern era. And they've, they're whipped into a frenzy over this stuff. It's just silliness. And yet they want to impose insanity on the entire country and then take away your tax exempt status if you are refuse to go along with the insanity. I, a, a buddy of mine who is a progressive says when he was little, he thought the emperor has no clothes story was the most ridiculous story he ever heard because who in their right mind would go along with uh, telling an emperor that your clothes are gorgeous when he's actually naked? Who who would do that? No one would do that. No adult would do that. And he says, you know, in the age of Trump, I, I, I realize that this is this is so true. All of these people, they're, they're not willing to tell Donald Trump he has no clothes. They're, they're not willing to stand up to Donald Trump. It takes the children to stand up to Trump. I thought, dude, have you been paying attention to this transgender movement thing? I mean, you, you, it's not only that no one wants to stand up and, and tell the emperor he has no clothes, but the kid who does is hauled off to a re-education camp. It's just, it absolutely is bizarre. And the way they have gone full-throated into this, I mean, what is essentially madness on the Democratic Party? And if you don't go along with it, they're going to take your tax-exempt status away. They're going to punish your church. They're going to punish your nonprofit. Do you know, here in Georgia, there is a movement to target faith-based adoption agencies among the left. There are a number of faith-based adoption agencies. In fact, there's one here in Macon uh, that my church supports, Covenant Care. And you've got to be, um, you can't be a gay household to adopt. Why? Because the Bible says marriage is between a man and a woman. And so they want you to be a married heterosexual household to adopt. They believe that's most stable for the kids. And there are a number of progressive groups out there who want this adoption agency shut down. And there are others like them. There are some Catholic adoption agencies in the state. I believe there's one Orthodox Jewish adoption agency in the state. And the progressive groups want them shut down. This is becoming an issue in Atlanta. It's becoming an issue in Clark County, in Athens. It's becoming an issue with faith-based adoption agencies where progressive groups want them put out of business because they're not willing to adopt outside of a heterosexual married couple. And what's happening if they're successful is that the pool of adoption agencies shrinks. 
it's not that suddenly everyone embraces gay marriage. It's that those close. See, the the left really believes um, that this this God stuff is silly. And so if they if they move forward and force this, these adoption agencies, they won't close. They'll just abandon their their religious beliefs. And they're wrong on that, actually. These adoption agencies will close their doors. So what will happen if the left wins here in the state, and by the way, you should know, the Republicans in the state are siding with the left. The Republicans in Georgia are siding with the left-wing groups. They're refusing to pass protections for faith-based adoption agencies. Tennessee, uh, um, Mississippi and Texas and Oklahoma, all three passed faith-based protections for religious adoption agencies. And they were lit up by progressive groups, including members of the NBA, ironically. Georgia caved. Nathan Deal, as governor, buckled under left-wing pressure and would not go along with the plan to protect faith-based adoption agencies. And they're coming to shut them down. And what will happen is you're not gonna you're not actually gonna help the kids. You're gonna reduce the pool of adoption agencies through which children could be adopted. See, these gay rights activists, they can go to a bunch of adoption agencies in the state right now, and they can adopt if they want to. But they're more interested in limiting the pool of adoption agencies to ensure that Christians cannot operate an adoption agency in Georgia if they maintain their faith. And Beto O'Rourke and the Democrats are now coming out and saying, you know what, I'm okay with that. That should be troubling to people who really are committed to child advocacy. Because what you're ultimately doing is you're making it harder for people overall to adopt because you're actually reducing the number of outlets by which someone can adopt in the state. But it's all about advancing an ideology. It's it's not about helping the kids. It's about advancing an ideology, and that's deeply problematic. And so you can you should be able to understand. This is the, the, the answer to the question of why do evangelicals stand with a man who has cheated on multiple wives with multiple porn stars? Because they know that he's actually allowing them to live their faith even if he has none. He's allowing them to maintain their businesses and nonprofits without being punished for upholding their orthodoxy. And the left, meanwhile, makes it very clear from Beto O'Rourke to Elizabeth Warren, to Cory Booker, to Joe Biden, to Amy Klobuchar, to Kamala Harris, they're out to get them. Have you seen the snakehead fish? The northern snakehead. Man, this is a creepy animal. Um, one was found in Gwinnett County, Georgia. It is a fish, <clears throat> excuse me, that uh, has an air sac in it. It can breathe air. It can survive on land for up to four days. Uh, it is an invasive species that competes for land and air, for food and habitat. It goes after small mammals and voraciously consumes other fish as well. Now, there are no reports of the fish being spotted anywhere else in the state right now. Just one in, in Gwinnett County. Uh, there is suspicion it could be from private release. I tell you, I don't know why people are so stupid. Well, I, I mean, people are stupid. People are dumb. But the python situation in the Florida Everglades is because of of idiots releasing their pythons into the wild instead of taking them to the zoo. And they're overrunning the place now. We're we're finding these giant lizards now from Argentina down in South Georgia. Have you heard about this? There's the these giant four foot long black and white lizards. They're finding them in South Georgia, and and they believe somebody released them. And they breed prolifically, and they're they're spreading through South Georgia. They're trying to find them and exterminate them. And now we got this this northern snakehead fish. If you see them. Uh, essentially, if you see a fish walking on dry land, kill it and kill it quickly. They are pervasive and in, invading. Now, I got to tell you, um, there's something else that just is bugging me. Uh, the AJC, uh, his Ed Kilgore is a political left-wing political operative, uh, formerly of Georgia, and then Bill Torpy, who is in the AJC. Both of them are just upset with Georgians for being upset that the Braves got rid of the tomahawk chop. It makes us look like rubes. That's what Bill Torpy writes. Y'all, I'm really tired of progressives 
taking positions because of what other people think. Ed Kilgore says it's just, we're, this is ugly. It's acting ugly. We have a mega racist history in Georgia. Are you really offended by the tomahawk chop that came to Georgia from FSU when they put Deion Sanders on the payroll of the Braves? Really? Uh, the, the, the amount of left-wing public policy that is structured to be liked, and, and the thing is, uh, the, these little things are being stuck into the AJC and elsewhere because much of the media agrees with these leftists. This just isn't nice. It's just not kind. You you can see it in the way the AJC and, and other media outlets in Georgia cover religious liberty in Georgia. You can see the way that they cover uh, the adoption issue in Georgia. Uh, to heck with the faith-based adoption agencies maintaining their, their biblical orthodoxy. These people are bigots and they need to be put out of business. That's That's the way the media covers these stories. As opposed to we should be able to respect people's uh, fundamental religious beliefs. No, 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 they're bigots. We got to shut them down. Same with Chick Fil A. Just it's it's pathetic when you see this level of media bias. I mean, we're talking about the Braves and the Tomahawk Chop. Uh, they gave it up and they lost the game. Maybe they'll rethink things next time. Absolutely silly to apologize for stuff like that. It is thirty-five after the hour. I am Eric Erickson. Let me give you your impeachment update. The White House behind the scenes is more nervous than they are in public. And on top of that, they are, well, they're not really telling the president the extent of it. Um, it, it's, it's, it's interesting, actually. It's, it's, it's rather interesting. Um, so White House staffers are concerned about the Senate. Now I, I can tell you, uh, I have really good sources in Congress and here is what I am being told. If impeachment were, if the impeachment trial were held, the president would have a unanimous vote of the Senate Republicans in his favor right now. There would be a unanimous vote by Republicans. Mitt Romney, Ben Sass, Mike Lee, Marco Rubio, Rand Paul, Ted Cruz, all, all of them. Uh, Susan Collins even, um, Richard Burr, all of them. They would absolutely, absolutely they would um, vote for the president. The problem for the president is that the vote's not happening now. The vote uh, is not going to happen anytime soon. And that is allowing uh, wavering among Republicans. There's there's a political uh, Politico story right now. Uh, president, this is Alex Eisenstadt, a pretty fair reporter at Politico. President Trump wants to sideline Mitt Romney, but the Utah senator isn't having it. Even as he faces a barrage of attacks from the president and his allies, Romney is mapping out plans to play a central role in 2020, headlining party events, shelling out cash from his campaign war chest, and heating up his donor network for vulnerable senators on the ballot next year. Later this month, Romney will take his most aggressive step yet to insert himself into 2020 when he hosts a New York City fundraiser for Susan Collins, Cory Gardner, and John James, the Michigan Senate hopeful. All are establishment-aligned figures confronting tough races in swing states. Behind the scenes, Romney's team has begun directing his donors to help GOP candidates in Senate battlegrounds. Romney aides say he always intended to help in competitive races. Now, here's the problem. The, the president is trying to make it radioactive for the Senate Republicans to work with Romney. They don't want the um, they, they don't want the Senate Republicans to be seen with him, and the reason they don't is they are nervous that essentially what Romney is trying to do is build goodwill among Senate Republicans right now, so that when a win, it's not it's not an if situation anymore. It's a it's a win, so that when an impeachment trial does come, uh, they'll listen to Romney. And Romney will essentially tell him, hey, my donors and I have your back. 
the situation, it, it, there's a lot of paranoia in the White House, and I've been trying to explain to some of them, you, you don't need to be right now. Even Mitt Romney would vote for President Trump right now based on what is known. He's concerned, but there's no there there, and Romney understands there's no there there. And the problem for the White House is that the Democrats intend to drag this out. Gordon Sundland is going to testify now next week. He is the president's ambassador to the EU. And there is a problem in his exchanges with the, um, with the oh, what is it, the Ukrainian, the ambassador to Ukraine. If you will recall... Uh, the Ukraine ambassador, the, our ambassador to Ukraine, suggests to Gordon Sundland, Gordon, it sounds like there's a quid pro quo here, um, that they're going to help the president dig up dirt on Joe Biden, and, and we're holding up money for that. And there was a four-hour gap between Sundland responding and, and actually texting back, oh, don't be silly and stop texting me, call me if you if you want something. In that four hours, according to different sources, Sundland called the White House to check in. And they're going to grill Sunlin about that. He's a he's not a professional diplomat. He was a, a hotel operator. And that's going to that that's gonna be an issue. On top of that, we now know that uh, John Bolton had concerns. There are multiple reports, and Bolton is not pushing back on them. And that should, John Bolton always pushes back on media reports, and he's not pushing back on this one. There are multiple reports that John Bolton was deeply concerned about the Ukraine phone call and that people underneath Bolton who were on the phone call reported to Bolton, and Bolton bunkered down with people in his office to try to figure out what to do about it. And as they were doing it, Bolton reached out to get the transcript, to see it, to read it, and discovered it was being put in uh, it was being put in the secure server. They're gonna want to call John Bolton. They the House has subpoenaed Rick Perry. Now Rick Perry doesn't have anything to do with it. Uh, understand that. Perry's the one who told the president that he needed to call Ukraine's president. He had been pushing for better relations. Now, I know this. Rick Perry and I are friends. Rick Perry called a couple months ago. My wife was having oncology scans, and uh, he had been in Ukraine, and we were talking about his trip to Ukraine. He had gone over there um, for the inauguration. He had had it all over Instagram and stuff, uh, really a big proponent of establishing ties to Ukraine. Uh, and helping Ukraine be more independent. Ukraine, to some degree, has been dependent on Russian uh, natural gas, and he's trying to find ways to make it uh, less dependent on Russia. Um, and so he, he, Rick Perry is saying, yeah, I arranged the phone call, but we didn't mention Joe Biden. And now the vice president's having to come out on this as well. I never discussed uh, the issue of of uh, the issue of the Bidens with President Zelensky oh, and uh, I, uh, what I what I can tell you is that all of our discussions internally between the president and our team and our contacts in my office with Ukraine were entirely focused on the broader issues of the lack of European support you're, you're and corruption. Yeah, you see, the, the vice president is being dragged into this now. Rick Perry is being dragged into this much of the administration. And, and here's the thing. It all comes from Rudy Giuliani. Rudy Giuliani has done such a bad job serving this president. A genuinely bad job serving this president. And in so doing, uh, he's dragging this president down into scandal. And the president needs to cut ties with Rudy Giuliani as quickly as possible. Here's what we know about the Ukrainians who tried to flee the country. They, too, were supposed to testify to the House. And is this, y'all, this is really, this, this is probably the most bizarre story of the week. Uh, so these guys, there were actually four of them. It, it, two of them are indicted. Um, four of them, they were trying to make a, uh, they, they wanted to build a recreational marijuana uh, facility in Nevada. There is a suspicion 
this is tied into the Russian mob. But just as an aside here, let, let me go on a complete tangent here about recreational marijuana nationwide. Uh, what people are finding is that organized crime from other countries is beginning to try to play a role in this country. Now, no people who support recreational marijuana, they don't like to talk about this because it is an angle that's coming in, but there are a lot of farmers in California, Nevada, and Colorado, and elsewhere who are under extraordinary pressure from outside organized crime elements and gangs in Mexico. Uh, the Russian mob, Mexican gangs, even the, the Japanese mafia are all pressuring these farmers uh, to share revenue with them. And because the federal government has not legalized these markets per se, they can't really go to the federal government for help. It's becoming a real problem in some of these areas. And so there is a suspicion that this oligarch, this Russian, who is helping these guys fund this, it may be a Russian oligarch, gangster, somebody up to no good. They don't know. In fact, we don't even know who the person is. Uh, there, there's just a lot of speculation on that. But these guys wanted to set up a, a recreational marijuana facility in, in Nevada. And they were having such a good time, they missed the deadline to file the paperwork. And so they had to start throwing cash around to get the the rules changed to let them back in. And they were dropping $10,000, $20,000 on people to try to get them to reopen. And it doesn't appear that they were successful, but somehow along the way, and I'm not really clear on this, and I've actually looked into it, and, I, and, and nobody seems to be clear on it, they, they connected to Rudy Giuliani. And they convinced Giuliani they had information on Joe Biden in Ukraine. There's no evidence that they actually did. These guys appear to be idiots. But they convinced Giuliani they had the goods on Joe Biden if Giuliani would help them. And they would help Giuliani. And that appears to be where a lot of this comes from, is two hustlers trying to open a weed shop in Nevada. Uh, but what they were doing, just so you understand... It is against the law for foreigners to participate in American politics. We've been through this ad nauseum over the last couple of years. But this Russian oligarch was giving these guys money, and then they were taking the money and making campaign contributions. These two are American citizens, and they were acting as the go-between for the Russian money. They were saying, hey, let's give Pete Sessions. Pete Sessions was a Republican congressman from Texas. Let's give Pete money. And they would pour money into him, uh, his campaign. And then there was a Trump super PAC. There was a Trump super PAC, and they were pouring money into the Trump super PAC. Rudy Giuliani apparently got these guys to have have lunch with the president. I, I played the audio before, but uh, this is this is worth listening to again from the president. I don't know those gentlemen. Now it's possible I have a picture with them because I have a picture with everybody. I have a picture with everybody here, but uh, somebody said there may be a picture or something where at a fundraiser or somewhere uh, so but i have pictures with everybody i have i don't know if there's anybody i don't have pictures with. i don't know them uh i don't know about them i don't know what they do but uh i don't know maybe they were clients of rudy you'd have to ask rudy i just don't know well they were clients of rudy and rudy had lunch with them on wednesday before they tried to flee the country with one-way tickets to austria uh, Rudy himself headed to Austria, so they were supposed to testify before the House of Representatives and instead decided to flee to Austria, having committed. This is the, this is the funny part. They actually told the House Democrats they would come and then got one-way tickets out of the country. <laughs> Rudy is just, Rudy is like he's the wily e. coyote of presidential advisors. Uh, this stuff is going to end badly for the president because he keeps relying on on old geezers like Rudy Giuliani. And no respect to old geezers out there, but uh, <laughs> come on, this is just this is amateur hour with Rudy. And now, of course, there is the question of who paid Rudy. How is Rudy making a money? And again, we need to go to the president of the United States. <laughs> It was reported. Are you concerned that Rudy Giuliani could be indicted in all of this? Well, I hope not. Again, I don't know how he knows these people. They're what? They're his clients. Okay, well, then they're clients. I mean, you know, he's got a lot of clients. So I just don't know. I haven't spoken to Rudy about it. I don't know. I will say this. From what I heard, I just heard about this. They said, we have nothing to do with it. We're totally, we have nothing to do with it. We, they're his clients. He's got a lot of clients. Well... Yeah, and so 
here's the problem. Giuliani doesn't actually have an official role in the White House, but the president's been funneling a lot of his um, foreign policy through Rudy Giuliani. Giuliani has been picking up clients, and this is the most bizarre one. Giuliani apparently went to the president and tried to convince the president to help him with someone who is in legal trouble in Turkey or in jail in Turkey or something. And Rex Tillerson, then the Secretary of State, came into the room while they were there, and the president said, Rex, help Rudy with this problem. And Tillerson, of course, said, heck no, we're not doing that. That would be illegal. (laughs) So the president sent Rudy Giuliani over to the Justice Department. I mean, listen, here's the thing. Rudy Giuliani and the president are friends. They appeared in drag together in, in some old ad. They have been longtime friends. The president is, is trying to help his buddy out. This is what you do in New York real estate. You scratch your back, I'll scratch you. You scratch my back, I'll scratch your back. This sort of thing. And that's what he's doing. Of course, the president's the president now, and he can't really operate like he used to operate, and, and he doesn't understand that. And Rudy should know that because Rudy was a federal prosecutor. Rudy was a federal prosecutor, y'all. He should know that you can't do this sort of stuff. And he told, got the president to call the Justice Department, and the Justice Department said, we can't do this. It's just genuinely bizarre. Uh, y'all, I mean, really, this is this is silly stuff. This, this is really silly stuff. <laughs> Rudy is going to get the man impeached. He's going to get the man impeached. Oh, my goodness gracious. So now he's got these Ukrainian people, and they were fleeing the country. He's got this client, this this guy in Turkey who is paying him to try to help him get out of trouble. He tried to get the president to do it. He's got these two old old guys from South Florida who um, are American citizens but born in the Soviet Union to supposedly dig up dirt on Biden. He's feeding all this stuff to the president. Apparently, these two old guys were also helping an independent investigation of Biden. And we now know that one of the prosecutors that they paired everybody with who's been telling them this stuff doesn't even have a law license, which is one reason he wasn't allowed to continue on as a prosecutor in Ukraine. You can't make this stuff up. And what's happening here is that the president's friends are getting the president in trouble. It is the president's friends feeding the president this information. It is the president's friends who are convincing him of all of this stuff. And it is the president who is acting on the stuff being fed to him by his most loyal friends, his lifelong friends, and they're a bunch of idiots. The Rudy Giuliani, who was a federal prosecutor, would be indicting the Rudy Giuliani of 2019 for what's happening right now. And Rudy is really doing a disservice to the president. And I, I got to think, and there seem to be warning signs at the White House that the president may be getting a clue that Rudy is not doing him any favors and that Rudy is going to cost him the presidency. I mean, it's, it's just let me put this in perspective for you. If the president of the United States is impeached, it will be because of the insanity of Rudy Giuliani and his old geezer friends and the dirt they supposedly dug up on Joe Biden. It'll be because the president listened to his friends. That's just goofy. But that's where we are in American politics. Uh, And and that's really a shame, too. It really is a shame Um, because it has been a distraction from the good policies this president has implemented. And yeah, he has implemented good policies, whether you, whether you like the president or not. You know, your life has not fundamentally been upended by this president. It really hasn't. Uh, much like a Republicans' lives were not fundamentally upended by Barack Obama other than took their health care away and, and ruined health care for everybody. All this president's done is give you more take-home pay. And Rudy and his goofy clients may bring all of that to an end, but hey, at least we'd have Mike Pence. All right. Uh, there's some new details we know about Parnas and Fruman. Parnas and Fruman are the two arrested men who were uh, Rudy Giuliani's clients. Let me read you this uh, from the dispatch. Parnas and Fruman, along with an oil baron named Henry Sargent, hatched a plan to ingratiate themselves with senior executives at Ukraine's natural gas company, Naftogaz, uh, by talking up their political connections to Trump. 
As part of their pitch, the schemers let on they had insider knowledge of the Trump administration's strategy for the region. They told one executive that Trump planned to replace the U.S. ambassador with someone more open to aiding their business interests. Rudy Giuliani met with Parnas and another personal associate, Healy Baumgardner, the CEO of a Houston-based lobbying group called 45 Energy Group, to discuss a potential energy deal and the status of Ambassador Yovanovitch, uh, the American ambassador to Ukraine, although Giuliani maintains the potential deal involved Uzbekistan, not Ukraine. Giuliani, who it's worth pointing out is Trump's personal attorney and has no official role in the government, acknowledged pushing the president to replace the American ambassador who and has previously described Parnas and Fruman as personal clients. President Trump has distanced himself from all of this, telling reporters he didn't know the man and they would have to talk to Rudy Giuliani. Uh, the two men did have a uh, lunch with the president at the White House. It's a web of alleged corruption. It's all tangential, tangential to the main accusations that have Democrats pressing towards impeachment. And the Giuliani-related stories continue to drop. It's going to be interesting to see if the Democrats wrap all of this up together. Now, the more troubling situation here is that it appears that there may be FBI recordings of the conversations between Giuliani and the individuals. Consider that. Now, before we get out of here, a high school in New Orleans is turning down a free Chick-fil-A lunch for its chief teaching staff because of gay rights. The company has donated millions of dollars to organizations that oppose same-sex marriage. A company official criticized same-sex marriage in 2012, and now the Lucier High School principal, Dr. Stephen Corbett, said that the chicken chain's values don't mesh with the school's motto of be kind. Have you never been to a Chick-fil-A? The motto of the school is be kind? Out of respect to our LGBTQIAABCDEFG staff, We have chosen to not serve Chick-fil-A at an employee lunch. Good gracious. What a group of idiots. Um, Man, have they never been to it? Those are the nicest people on earth. My pleasure. My pleasure. Good grief. All right. I'll see you guys on Wednesday. Have a good weekend. I'm off with my kids.